Miles, hello, how are you? Hi, Andy, I'm well, how are you? Yeah, I'm really good, thank you. Um, I should warn our viewers that before I pressed record for this film, you made me laugh so much that I temporarily lost my voice. So I'm very uh, excited and nervous for this film in which who knows what might happen. And I'm delighted that Sarah Vaughan is the presiding deity over our conversation. Yes. You've raised expectations too high. Now people that aren't laughing from the word go uh, or who aren't serenaded by Sarah Vaughan will automatically, uh, you know, tune out. So... Okay, well, I'll lower expectations. I have a weird sense of humour, so, you know, I'm not saying anything about how hilarious it was for anyone else, just, just for me personally. <laughs> I'm not funny. I'm never <laughs> um, May I ask you, when you finished having your, your drink, um, whether you uh, could introduce yourself and tell us a bit about your work, please? Sure, yes. So I'm Miles Greer. I am an assistant professor at Queens College CUNY in New York. Uh, the epicenter of the epicenter mm -hmm. uh, in terms of COVID. So it's been quite uh, a past few months here. Mm -hmm. uh, I joke a little bit that, you know, scholars talk about the long 18th century going from the restoration in the 1660s to 1820. Uh, and we are currently living in the long 2020. Uh, it is clearly not over. Uh, but um, I teach in the English department and uh, I sometimes say that I do various renaissances, uh, the English Renaissance, the American Renaissance, and the Harlem Renaissance. Hmm. That's not the entirety of what I do, uh, but it's a good shorthand uh, for some of the uh, concerns and questions that brought me uh, to my intellectual work. So uh, I'm currently finishing a book which is tentatively, tentatively titled Ink Face, Atlantic in art. No, that is no longer the subtitle. <laughs> uh, the formation of white interpretive, Othello and the formation of white interpretive community, mm. uh, 1604 to 1855. So that gets at least the English Renaissance and the American Renaissance in. Uh, and what I'm looking at is a sort of forgotten history of Othello, a history that is actually determined less by uh, what scholars have usually looked at, uh, which is um, high points, for example, in the uh, transshipment of Africans across the Atlantic. Uh, and they've sort of looked at those kinds of moments as determining how Othello was staged and what it could mean. Uh, and my sense is that uh, theater has its own conventions that allow for characters to be recognizable across time. Uh, and in the case of Othello, the theatrical convention across 1604 to 1855 that's actually relatively stable mm. is the use of blackface. And once we start paying attention to that makeup, uh, we start to see that the questions that we've usually asked, well, what does Moore mean? Does it mean North African, does it mean Sub-Saharan African? How many Black people lived in Shakespeare's London? Uh, that those questions pale in comparison, forgive me, uh, to, <clears throat> uh, pale in, par in comparison to the question uh, of how makeup acts on stage. And this particular Black makeup uh, transfers from Othello to Desdemona and so you get his uh, final couplet, which people have not paid close enough attention to as a sort of uh, document of actual stage, a staged event. Uh, he says, I kissed thee ere I killed thee, no way but this, killing myself to die upon a kiss. And I always thought it was die, you know, <clears throat> you know, bite the big one. Um, but in fact, it is die as in stain, he stains Desdemona with his kiss. Mm. And once we start to think about that pun, I mean, of course he does both, right? <laughs> uh, but once we start to think about that pun, a lot of different moments in the play read very differently. And we also start to see that in terms of the history of race, Richard Burbage, uh, Edmund Keane, 
Uh, well, he played it in brown face, but these Othellos who were white men who were painted can die Desdemona with their kiss. Mm -hmm. And Robeson, James Earl Jones, uh, Lawrence Fishburne cannot. And so the black person who is involved in Shakespeare's Othello has no relation to the black person that I am, mm -hmm. right? Uh, because this particular Moor has this function of dying with his kiss and sort of leaving this telltale stain on Desdemona mm -hmm. that marks her as a dishonest woman. I mean, it's not true. She isn't a dishonest woman, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and the same mark that makes her appear to be unfaithful. You know, we talk about a black mark against her character. Mm -hmm. The same black mark against her character is actually really just you know, Othello's monograph, you know, <laughs> you know, or I'm sorry, monogram, you know, that he has, you know, kind of put his signature on her. Uh, but because Black is sort of overdetermined as this mark of sinfulness, um, you know, adultery, dishonesty, slavery, even, um, Desdemona uh, dies doubly. Um, so that's part one of this. Uh, and the last piece that I'll say right now um, is that the other kind of weird thing about <clears throat> that, that, that uh, emerges when we start to pay attention to things like makeup um, is that Othello compares Desdemona to paper. Mm. And so his blackness is also the blackness of ink. You know, he says, was this fair paper, this most goodly book made to write whore upon? Um, and so this also becomes a play about literacy. Um, and for my money, uh, the racial work and the gendered work that the play does uh, has to do with creating a class of people who are understood as reading material. They've been marked with the same blackness that is the blackness of ink. Mm -hmm. And therefore they are not part of this uh, elite literate white fraternity mm -hmm. that the Venetian senators are a part of, which is why that long tedious bit um, about um, the movements of the Turk uh, yeah. at the, you know, uh, act one, I think that's act one, scene five. Um, it's all paperwork, right? <laughs> it's all bureaucratic messages are coming in, you know, mm. some are oral, some are written, and the senators of Venice have to um, read uh, between the lines, as it were. Mm. Uh, and Othello and Desdemona, both of whom are blackened over the course of the play, wind up being the bad readers. And so what you get implicitly, uh, and that's what the book is really about, uh, what you get implicitly is this fraternity of literate white men. And this is at the same moment, um, well, a long moment, 1604 to 1855, uh, where literacy is becoming a shared property, a kind of state project, right? You know, that it's no longer just going to be priests that are literate, um, mm -hmm. but this idea that vernacular literacy is going to be um, something the state is interested in promoting, you know, we tend to think of that as just like functional, right? We're gonna teach the alphabet, but it's like, no, it has these religious connotations because we're teaching, you know, literacy through the Bible. Mm -hmm. um, and so that means if you're Jewish, if you're Muslim, mm -hmm. right, you know, and you're not, and the Bible is not your text, or for that matter, if you're Native American, if the Bible is not your text, then you're automatically being excluded from this seemingly neutral yeah. technology of literacy. So it has this weird implicit uh, kind of racial politics um, of creating a group of people who are thought of as um, masterful readers and sort of uh, able to commune with God and able to interpret the world uh, and those people who are thought of as uh, not only, as I said, reading material, uh, but also as sort of bad readers and producers of nonsense. Uh, so that in a nutshell is the project, you know, uh, it, it, it ends with uh, Mike Brown and Christine Blasey Ford uh, here in the U.S. Uh, because I want to show that this kind of fraternity of mm -hmm. white male experts um, with a kind of unimpeachable credibility uh, has persisted, um, you know, to this day. Uh, and that suspect women uh, and suspect Negroes 
uh, still mm -hmm. have difficulty uh, being heard and being thought of as credible, mm -hmm. and that uh, this uh, indestructible play, Othello, uh, is sort of the, is a vector through which we can trace how that sort of interpretive authority uh, got created and maintained. Wow, thank you. Um, that was a lot, so I need to stop and I'm I back. know. <laughs> uh, back some of that. Uh, it's fantastic, thank you very much, Miles. Um, I mean, one of the kind of through lines through a lot of the different things you said there is about how time and moments can have unexpectedly long durations. You talked about yes. a long moment at one point, and we are, as you say, in, in long 2020, and we'll probably be here for many decades to come. Sorry, everybody. Please, uh, please. Um, Let it not be so. So if, if I can just work through a few of those things, I mean, I'm fascinated by what you say about that very long scene at the start of Othello, um, and I have no idea when in that, at one it occurs, but it occurs at the end of that one, right? And um, yes. at, at one up to that point has been characterised by really quite short scenes in which men are chasing after something, whether that's Iago and Rodrigo looking for Brabancho's house or Brabancho then looking for Desdemona, and then mm -hmm. there's great chaos on the streets as people are looking for Othello. Mm -hmm. Suddenly you go from that world in which, you know, successive iterations of dudes on streets <laughs> trying to get somewhere else to find something, hunting, basically. Yes. We suddenly get into this scene of, as you, as you put it, a fraternity of literate white men, and, and they are the epicenter to which documents yes. and news yes. are brought. So there's a kind of dramaturgical yes. and rhythmical underpinning mm -hmm. to some of the things that you're saying there that I think's um, really fascinating. And then you very modestly kind of confined your account of your work to Othello, but I know from other examples of your work that Titus Andronicus is very important as well, and a more general history of of ink facing, if I may borrow your term. Please, um, and it kind of, <laughs> tell your friends. <laughs> <laughs> but, but of thinking about racialized identity uh, as a form of bookish ink on black ink on white paper mm -hmm. um, and, and vice versa, kind of reading mm -hmm. bodies via text and reading text via, via body. So I definitely like to think um, a bit more about that, if I may. You very brilliantly described Titus Andronicus as a hidden transcript of non-expert mm -hmm. early modern racial thought. Mm -hmm. And I'd really like to return to that phrase at some point um, and unpack that with you. And then and then finally, I'll shut up in a minute, just trying to kind of tease out some of the things that you've got us thinking about already. But um, yeah, I love this idea of a kind of long moment of shared vernacular literacy, where that literacy is kind of being wielded as a colonizing tool. Who gets to have literacy, who doesn't, and what gets to count as vernacular mm -hmm. and what doesn't. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. That all feels really important. Uh, I feel like I've I've matched your big picture with an, another version of the big picture rather than giving us um, helpful, helpful detail. Maybe we should start with a fellow as, as you described it, as the indestructible play. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. I mean, Thomas Reimer tried to kill it, you know, it was 1693 and he said, this thing is crap. It's, you know, it's, um, what, what, oh, I, of course I'm losing the phrase right now, but something, you know, um, something about an implausible farce. Yeah. You know, um, much ado about a handkerchief and all this kind of thing. Yeah. You know, uh, people have known the score on Othello for, you know, 400 years now. <laughs> Maybe uh, we're, in, we're in Malong 1693 and we just haven't quite got there yet. <laughs> well, I mean, it makes me wonder what is appealing about this utterly impossible play. It would seem, I'm sorry, what was that? Tell us more, tell us more. Uh, well, what, <laughs> it, it, it would seem that we would have dropped it by now. Um, so that makes me wonder, why is it that the implausibility, let's talk about just one of the forms of, I mean, there are, you know, Reimer has his, his uh, sort of litany of Im implausible things, but let's start with a fellow isn't a person. You know, there's nothing plausible. Um, there's no sort of archival grounding, you mm -hmm. know, where, you know, people have tried to say, ah, um, and of course I'm going to uh, get his name wrong, but the Moroccan ambassador who 
visits Queen Elizabeth. Ah, that's the basis for Othello. Well, no, because the Moroccan ambassador goes home. You know, he doesn't say, before I leave, I just have to show you, Elizabeth, that I've always been true to you and I've always been a servant of the state. You know, none of this su honorable suicide that, you know, if you are truly an aristocrat in your own country, as Othello says he is, then being fired by the Venetian Senate, what do you care? <laughs> you know, if you truly are a nobleman, and um, a husband in a patriarchal society, you say, I'm taking my woman and I'm going back to Mauritania. You know, <laughs> like you just use your patriarchal privilege. Mm. So why does that never cross Othello's mind? Why is it only Iago who makes that up as a lie, you know, to keep Rodrigo strength strong along? You know, why does Othello never think that? Mm. So are you, are you saying in a way that he doesn't yeah. think like a like a like a migrant or uh, as someone who has ties elsewhere or he doesn't think well he doesn't think like an aristocrat right. he doesn't think like a man <laughs> you know in the patriarchal sense of it um you know and i you know i i certainly understand you know that feminist critics would say well he thinks like a man enough to kill his wife mm. you know he thinks he has ownership of her that's certainly true you know that's indisputable um but the way to avoid that <laughs> would be, I'm a man, fire me from the, you know, I don't have to be general of your army, I can go home. You know, I mean, as a p very plausible Negro myself, <laughs> that's what I would do. You know, like, you know, like, I'd go home. I don't have to be here. I don't have to take this. You know? And so the fact that he never considers that mm. Um, means that he can't be rooted in any so, in in any kind of social structure. You know, so he says these things, right? Like I'm, you know, I fetch my life and blood from men of noble being, or something like that. Um, but a person who really had that kind of footing in a society could use it. And he doesn't, you know. Um, and so I find myself thinking of it, that Othello is more, as I said before, of a function than a person. And his mm -hmm. function is to convey this stain to Desdemona. Hmm. But he's not a plausible person. Uh, but then you get the, the sort of new version of Othello is rooted in something, which is, you know, after black actors sort of take over the role, it's, ah, you know, Shakespeare felt our pain. You know, Shakespeare wrote a story about, you know, uh, this is what Robeson says, God bless him, you know. Um, but I think the mistake uh, that, that, that Robeson made, if I may be so bold to, to say that he made one, is that it wasn't that Othello wrote, or I'm sorry, that Shakespeare wrote a play that allowed him to expose um, or I'm sorry, that was made for him to expose global apartheid. Mm. It's that the act of having a black person play Othello and kiss a white woman on stage in 1930, um, I think 1943 is when it premieres on Broadway. It's that that, because of the ex expected theatrical conventions of the time, he was sort of able to bring global apartheid and U.S. Jim Crow into crisis. Hmm. But, th but Shakespeare never foresaw that, <laughs> you know, why would he? Like, I don't do the Shakespeare as Nostradamus, you know, or the Shakespeare as bleeding heart liberal who just sympathized with all God's creatures, great and small. You know, what reason would he have? Hmm. You know, so I sometimes say that Robeson hijacks Othello, you know, and as I also said, God bless him for doing it. Um, but for us to then think that Othello is socially, historically, or psychologically realistic, yeah, yeah, is preposterous. But as I said, that then makes me wonder: then why do we want to believe that? Mm -hmm. And I would say that the answer, I think, is that Othello is a play about character. Mm -hmm. 
and whether or not it's readable. And we live in a society that demands that we be able to read other people's character. And so we need that to be true for our everyday lives. And so since this is the play that relies on that, the mo well, I don't know about the most, let me not get in trouble, but re relies on it in a fundamental way, then we can't quite let it go, hmm. you know, because we're still, I mean, you know, um, all these court cases um, about sexual assault and sexual harassment wind up hinging on the very thing that, um, on the very problem that Desdemona faces. Mm. How do I convince you I'm not a whore when, when I'm sort of already marked that way? Mm. You know, so we still want to believe that, that there is a such thing as the woman that's a whore and that we can determine who does and does not deserve protection by sort of getting to that um, invisible character that everyone has, mm -hmm. and then we'll know, you know, well, that woman is deserving of protection and that one isn't uh, because of her character. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, what's Desdemona's plight but that? Mm -hmm. You know, so it seems to me that that that's part of why we can't let go of of, of Othello. You know, it it. Um, I mean, I would love to, <laughs> and I even have a plan for what <laughs> I might do it. Um, I, I I'm I, I'd love to have a kind of original con uh, original performance condition version of Othello, so that you don't have white women and black men, um, and now sometimes even black women. Uh, trying to redeem mm. Othello and Desdemona mm. by putting their own bodies and psychologies and histories and hearts on the line. Mm. But let it just be, this is some mindless dude who just stains everybody he touches. And then see if you still like Othello so much. You know? <laughs> like, <laughs> you know? like once Othello is sort of allowed to just be that function. Yeah you know, instead of this sort of symbol of black pain, I think we'd, I think people might decide it's time to fold up shop and do a night. As I said to my high school students once, do Coriolanus, do a play with some nice white people in it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> there are some pretty nasty white people in Coriolanus. There certainly are, that was the trip. <laughs> <laughs> there had been complaint that I did too much stuff with black people and I said, well then we'll do Coriolanus, that's fine. <laughs> Wow, I dream of a world in which it would be possible to complain of doing uh, too much, too much black early modern history. That sounds great. <laughs> Bring it on. I mean, I'm wondering if we're pushing here at that phrase I quoted earlier from you. Um, you've written a fantastic essay for Claire Bourne's forthcoming book, Shakespeare Text, um, where you talk about, as I say, Titus Andronicus being a kind of hidden transcript of, of non-expert mm -hmm. early modern racial thought. And I wonder if mm -hmm. some of the things you're telling us about Othello's character are telling us things are a transcript of Shakespeare's mm -hmm. non-expertise. Mm -hmm. he's, unable, <laughs> he's unable to imagine uh, how someone in that mm -hmm. position might feel or think. You know, I, I, I'd never thought of it that way, Andy, that, that Shakespeare is flaunting his ignorance. Um, but that's, <laughs> that's, that's, that's certainly true. Uh, and it's so nice to be in a place where one could say that. Um, you know, excellent playwright, but get some things wrong, you know? <laughs> you know? Like, um, when I wrote that phrase, um, I was thinking of the tendency of scholars to, to um, look for written documents about other people, you know, non-English people, mm. um, you know, by natural historians, you know, who were the sort of predecessors of bi biologists, um, by travel writers, um, and to assume that what the literate were printing mm. about these other people um, is the only source we have for what English people really thought of Group X. And I thought, well, we know that literacy was not universal at this point. Um, and we know that what was printed uh, served certain purposes. You know, it wasn't like, you know, 
you can just self-publish on Kindle. You know, like you had to have some kind of financial or state backing in order to get something printed at, you know, as a bound book, right? Mm -hmm. So the places where we look as scholars and sort of associate with the knowledge of the period, you know, what the, the shared knowledge of the period um, seems to me much less likely a place to look um, than the theater, which is a place where you can go and in, have, a, have a sense of sort of a shared experience and shared knowledge, even with varying levels of literacy in the audience. Yeah. You know, um, and so what if these plays are conveying something about whiteness as interpretive authority um, and blackness, not as a, one ethnic group, but just as that group of people who can't read, hmm. right? Um, and you as a non-literate white person can still have that experience of going, I know Othello's wife didn't cheat on him. How is he this dumb? I can't even read and I know that, <laughs> right? You know, so that the play um, implicitly summons this sort of audience of white experts. Um, and that's why perhaps it, it has something to tell us historical um, that isn't just reflecting the expert knowledge of the period of, of you know, aspiring scientists and other men of letters because it's purposely a spectacle that doesn't require print literacy yeah absolutely is it a play which assumes i'm trying to think through the implications of, of what you're saying which is fascinating is, is it a play that assumes uh an all-white audience is it a play that's open to racial diversity in the audience, do you think? And um... I don't think so. Um, <laughs> I mean, in its original iteration, I mean, of course, like I said, you know, things, things can happen that Shakespeare did not foresee. You know, I would only say that Othello with Paul Robeson or James Earl Jones or Lawrence Fishburne mm. as Othello is a different play. And I'm perfectly fine with that, right? Um, but we have to understand that that's not what was being seen in 1604 at Whitehall. Mm. You know, that that's not, um, and for centuries after, mm. you know, that that is not at all. And that when, uh, I should even go before Paul Robeson, you know, when Ira Aldridge takes over the role, they're purposely trying by putting their bodies in this previously all white performance space they're purposely challenging the institution of slavery or the institution of uh, Jim Crow and apartheid. Yeah. Um, but like I said, that's a hijacking and good on them, you know? <laughs> but, but to sort of, since they took all the risk, I don't know why Shakespeare gets all the credit, right? <laughs> right, yeah, absolutely. Um, and let me just say really quickly, mm. Peggy Ashcroft, you know, the, the white women who played Desdemona, um, across from these black men also took the risk, you know, so I'm not claiming that it's only the black people that have played yeah. Othello that, that once took the risk. I mean, these, these women risked their careers and, you know, uh, in South Africa, I, I'm forgetting this actor's name, but I mean, she got death threats, mm. you know, mm. so they took the risk. So I don't see why <laughs> Shakespeare uh, should be, you know, credited. Great, as I said, wonderful playwright. You know, social visionary, sometimes. <laughs> you mentioned, too, um, Whitehall Court performance, and um, I've been spending more time than I care to admit looking over um, the long history of 16th century court performance. And mm -hmm. um, you know, multiple Tudor courts spent their Christmases watching far too many masks about fishermen, as far as I'm concerned. I don't know how many, <laughs> how many masks about fishermen anyone needs to watch, but they watch loads. But even more than that, um, masks about Turks mm. and it feels like the Tudor court mm. and perhaps the Stuart court after them have this mm. weird fetish mm. about watching Ottomans mm. in masks and mm. um, a fellow is appearing at court alongside um, the mask of blackness right. and other masks which are thinking too about about race so right. I wonder what What's go this is a very general end to what I've just said, but I wonder what's going on there, Miles. <laughs> well, I mean, I couldn't say fully 
um, you know, uh, I'm not the expert in Turk plays, um, but, um, you know, my sense is that, uh, you know, I'm thinking of Anthony Bartholomew's work right now. Um, my sense is that England was very much, and of course, Kim Hall as well, England was very much imagining itself <clears throat> as a potential global force. Yeah, and wishing um, itself. Yes, and, if, and you know, um, some other scholars whom I won't name um, have said, well, but it wasn't yet. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm sitting here in the United States at a moment that I think people 200 years from now will look back and say, man, the US was circling the drain for a long time. But you could never look at the sort of state pageantry and discover that because no presidential candidate is going to say, we're done. Our best days are behind us. America's ruined. Mm. No. So you can't actually look at what the state is doing and how the state talks to itself about itself, right, to see what the state really is. Yep. And so, sure, mm. England was not the global empire that it became, but they sure wanted it bad. Mm. <laughs> you know? And it seems to me that that's what these um, yeah. exotic, um, you know, transoceanic, you know, like that that's what it's about, is about sort of being able to create the idea uh, gosh, I feel like, <laughs> I feel like Sarah Palin, you know, I can see Russia from my porch, you know, it's like, you know, that, you know, that from this seat of power in England, I can see the whole world. Yeah, I can see Istanbul from my Whitehall court. Um, <laughs> because again, we are, I mean, that is, it, it, looking at an audience of white experts, as you put it earlier, at, this time at court, so a very different kind of level um, of status, but what feels really striking to me is unlike the mask of blackness or the masks of Turks or indeed of fishermen, where it's all <laughs> about kind of collective mm. identity, which is not courtly white identity, um, Othello and also Titus Andronicus are instead inviting you to think about a single representative of otherness mm -hmm. in, a, mm -hmm. in an otherwise homogenous culture, which looks like yours. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, hmm. so that's probably a very factual observation. Yeah. It's a shift. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I, I'm not sure it matters um, that it's just one person okay. uh, in, in Titus Andronicus. You know, the, I want to say it's the 59, 1594 quarto sometimes just has Aaron as Moore in the, in the um, line. Why can't I? Why can't I say the word, Andy? You know what I'm saying. In the the speech oh, prefixes, the speech yeah, prefixes. Yeah, yeah, sometimes yeah. it's just more, you know. Um, and so, um, yeah, I think that their sort of representative status, mm -hmm. you know, um, and the kind of oddly impersonal mm -hmm. um, aspect of them is is what's at issue. And I would also say in Titus Andronicus. Um, and this is obviously indebted to Francesca Royster's brilliant essay from decades ago that still holds up. It, it's a Mediterranean play. So both the pale Goths and the dark Moor right. are barbarians in comparison to this Roman center. So um, I, would, I would say that part of what this is also showing is that this pan-European notion of whiteness has not yet gelled. Yeah. You know, it's going to have to be worked on, you know, um, and we know this from um, the Henriad, you know, the English and the French are not, <laughs> you know, um, natural allies. Mm. You know, there has to be a sort of rapprochement. <laughs> I didn't even mean to use that one, but you know, there has to be some kind of, um, ceasefire to say, okay, normally we'd be fighting each other, but now we're white against, you know, now we're European against some other thing, yeah. right? And yeah. in another moment, we'll go back to fighting each other. <laughs> but, you know, but for this moment, it'll be us, you know, versus them. So, I mean, I would just say, I think maybe something like the Merchant of Venice mm -hmm. 
maybe um, is an easier sort of substitution where the Venetians are the English. Mm. Um, but I think in something like Titus Andronicus, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's a bit, and even Merchant of Venice doesn't totally work because Portia makes fun of the Englishman who comes to court mm -hmm. her. So, I mean, you know, it's, it's tricky, but to me, it's fun watching white people work out their shit. <laughs> For anyone who wants to connect some of these ideas to another film we've made, um, which will be coming out just before yours, I think, Mars, um, Maria Schmiegel has been doing some work on European, on English English plane companies traveling around Europe. And um, she's fascinating on Titus Andronicus in adaptation in Germany, uh -huh. um, where, of course, the identification is with the Goths and not the Romans. Right. Um, so if you, if anyone would like to kind of pursue those ideas that you're, you're talking about of the kind of the non-homogenous European identities playing mm -hmm. with these stories, there are wow. some really interesting ways forward there as well. Wow. Um, Miles, it's been a really fun conversation. I think we should move towards wrapping up now. And okay. the, way we, the way we tend to end films is by asking what the word literature means to you. And you're welcome to answer this as personally or as professionally uh, as you like. We've already talked quite a bit about shared vernacular literacy and indeed denied literacy. Yes. Um, but yeah, do you mind telling us a little bit about where that word sits in your vocabulary? Sure. Um... I love the fact that literature um, in its fullest sense um, refers to all letters. And so that to me means that the purview of the literary scholar uh, extends to anything that has been written. Mm -hmm. um, so to treaties, to uh, you know, HTML code, you know, to whatever it is that we might want to um, decipher uh, and interpret. So that's, I think, a really wonderful thing about my job, you know, is that it could include anything that has been written or that can be deciphered, you know, or, you know, because to me, that's also like, there's this parallel thing of there are some things that are not written, but can be decoded in the same, you know, in the same way um, that we've, we've learned through uh, how we interact with writing. So that's the first thing. But the second thing isn't so much a definition of literature, but it's about what I think literature does. Um, and to me, the wonderful thing about literature is that it allows me to listen intently to someone who is not me. Yeah. I love and that. that's a guarantee, no matter who it is, they won't be me. Yeah. And as a person who talks a lot, <laughs> um, people sometimes mistake, um, I also love to listen. You know, make it worth my while, you know, say something better than what I was going to say. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, you know, if you have something interesting, well-formed, uh, even something that's interesting because it's sort of ill-formed, <laughs> I want to hear it. Yeah. You know, and that to me, um, that attitude um, that, that being a student of literature has taught me, I think is sorely um, needed mm -hmm. right now. Mm -hmm. um, and it's funny, I, I'll say just one last thing. It, it sort of takes me back to this thing about um, the seizing of interpretive authority for whiteness. Um, the antidote to that is okay, indigenous people, you have a symbol making system. It might be face paint, it might be wampum, it might be, but if we're going to interact on a plane as equals and not as one dominating the other, then we are going to have to accept the validity of your sign making system. Hmm. 
and not say, okay, well, how do you translate that into English or how, do you, or how do you get that printed or how do you, but you know, that your sign making system and you as interpreters of the world are legitimate hmm. and we're going to have to meet on a plane as equals and work it out. Hmm. You yeah. know, that to me uh, is what literature offers the opportunity uh, to do. And I would say, I, I include Shakespeare in that category, you know, um, uh, uh, the, the category of great literature, but not necessarily because I think he's better or, you know, unapproachable, uh, but because it has offered this opportunity for me to kind of go, for, for me to listen to what's really going on <laughs> underneath these plays mm -hmm. um, and get a sense of what I think the experiment is. And I'm sorry, just one last little, to me, the listening sometimes reveals something that the person didn't know they were saying. And I think that's the sort of interesting thing about following this Moore from the first time it appears in Titus Andronicus mm. all the way through to Antony and Cleopatra um, and following the, the, the transfer of color mm. in all of those plays, mm. um, you know, Cleopatra also dies upon a kiss. Mm. Um, hmm. And following ink and paper in all of the plays with Moors, you know, like it winds up becoming this interesting through line uh, that we wouldn't have seen if we didn't learn how to listen to the plays themselves instead of this is what the scholarly, tra scholarly tradition teaches us, or this is what the dictionary says Moore meant, or this is what the map says. You know, it's like, no, 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 just listen, just listen. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, that's my pitch for literature. <laughs> I love it. It's sort of also a pitch. Um, your second definition is almost a pitch for a bit lit, so I'm going to steal that as well. Allow me, allow me to listen intently to someone who is not me. I'm going to. Oh, well, you've had to that. do that today, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> Miles, it's been a real joy. Thank you so much. I've loved learning from you, and I'm really Thank inspired you. by what you shared with us today. Thank you so much. Thank you. This was really wonderful. Take care. <laughs>